filmmaker Jim Jarmusch helped start the New York independent film scene. His 1984 film, Stranger Than Paradise, startled audiences with its gritty, cool, and satiric edge. It went on to win top awards from the Cannes Film Festival and National Society of Film Critics. Dead Man, his latest work, it's coming some five years after the release of his last film, Night on Earth. Financed independently, it was purchased for distribution sight unseen by Merrimax Films. Dead Man is set in the Old West and stars Johnny Depp as an accountant mistaken for the poet William Blake and wanted for a murder he did not commit. I'm pleased to have Jim Jarmusch on this broadcast again. Welcome back. Thanks. Uh, why five years here between well, films? Well, a few reasons. Uh, this film I've been working on for two and a half years. So uh, it was actually finished quite a while ago and has been out in some territories since the first of this year. But the other reason is, I don't know, I got kind of lost for a while and didn't... I just felt like I didn't have anything to say for a period of time. About it, within the body of this film? Or no, just, no, no, before In this terms film. of making another film or doing something yeah. else? Yeah, after my last one, uh, Night on Earth, I just... There was a period where I just felt like, well, if you don't really feel like you have something to say, it's better not to say anything. Yeah. It wasn't any kind of tortured block or anything. And it gave me some time to just kind of observe things and, you know, not be working all the time. It was, I think, good for me. Why a Western? Why this genre? Because I'm told that you're not that crazy about Westerns and sort of the John Ford type Western, which seems to be part of Americana, is not something that you particular, you know, salute. Yeah, I mean, I'm interested in all forms, all genres of film, but Western is not one of my f of foremost, you know, interest. I don't know exactly why. I mean, there are a few reasons. The, the Western is, it's a kind of allegorical open form. I like that about it. Um, it's kind of a fantasy world that America has used to kind of process its own history through, often stamping a lot of ideology all over it. In the is, case I mean, it's a Ford. little bit like Henry Kissinger in a famous interview once said, I think with uh, Oriana um, uh, Falaci, said, I see myself you know, as a guy in a white hat coming into the town or something like that, as a sheriff coming into the town. We really do use it for myth and for allegory and for... Yeah, it's very... That's one thing that kind of annoys me about it is how mythological it becomes. Like the, you know, Indians, Native Americans, indigenous people in Westerns are, in classic Hollywood Westerns, are almost like mythological people that never really existed, you know, like... The dinosaurs that once roamed the land, you know, but they aren't really real to us. And that, that I find deeply upsetting. There's a lot of... Then why don't you make a film about them? Well, there's a, a large uh, part of Dead Man, you know, a, a large part of the film is about Aboriginal culture. Yeah. One of the two main characters is a Native character. Tell me how William Blake got into this, because uh, the poet... I mean, the story is that you happened to be looking for a book to read and picked up something and all of a sudden you saw in what you read some connection to the film script that you just prepared. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I was reading a lot of books, historical books, but mostly books by Native Americans or books concerning Ma Native American thought and I was just about to actually write the script. I've been making notes for a long time. And I did. I uh, picked up Blake to kind of clear my head, and uh, suddenly the connections were amazing to me. But I had been really influenced or inspired by Blake when I was younger, in my early 20s. How so? Well, I first, when I first read Blake, it like kind of blew my mind to read, you know, this kind of thought from uh, centuries ago, a very revolutionary, visionary, contradictory character, the way he lived his life. Uh, you know, he was against churches, against money, against prisons, against fashionable opinions, uh, against any kind of moral codes that he thought we were taught and educated to believe in that, that were, were against the nature of man. Um, very contradictory in a lot of ways. He was a mystic who also, his, he sort of reversed the pattern of mysticism by always looking for man at the end of the search, which is kind of anti-mystical in itself. So, I don't know, a lot of things about Blake. He, he keeps coming back, in the, certainly for the so-called beats in the late 50s, uh, in the late 60s. And I heard recently that 
a lot of the young, like rave kids in England, techno kids, are again really interested in Blake. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're interesting in a sense that that what you do and and how you go about it and and the subjects that you choose and and the sort of role. I mean, you're almost considered sort of the premier independent filmmaker in America. You, how do you feel about the reception to your films? And when you look at the reviews of this, uh, do, well, do you think they understand what you're trying to do, the reviewers? Well, oh. the film hasn't come out. It comes out tomorrow here in the States, so yeah. I haven't read the reviews. Um, I tend not to read a lot of reviews because I prefer not to know. You know, I don't expect everyone to like the film. It's a, it's a strange film. It, it is not a difficult film. Why is it strange? Well, it's very unfashionable. It's, it's black and white. It has a very hypnotic, almost hallucinatory rhythm to it. It is not full of power cuts and plot tension. Uh, it's kind of yeah. almost psychedelic in a way by the end of the film. It, it's and you know that there's an audience that may want some of those things, but you deliberately don't use them because you want to say something else or give some other mood and some other aesthetic. Well, you know, it's not really such a calculated, conscious response to anything. It's just the way that I want to tell a story. And so, luckily, I am allowed to be oblivious of the marketplace because my films are financed independently, whatever the hell that means anymore. I'm not even sure, but because everyone is independent or independents are treated like the minor leagues, you know, yeah. that might go up to the majors and... I just think of myself sort of on the periphery of, you know, the business of film, the business side of filmmaking. Let me talk about casting. Johnny Depp. Johnny, he, uh, quite an amazing actor and an, ama an amazing person. It's hard for me to separate the two in my head, uh, his work as an actor, but he is very focused and he had a really rough job in this film because it's a, he carries the film, he's the central character, but he's a passive character, which is not, certainly not the convention of most westerns and, and of most films. So it's not like a, it's not like My Left Foot or even Leaving Las Vegas. There's not a lot of sort of grandstanding possible in the character. It's very subtle. And it's an accumulate, uh, it's a, a character that accumulates a lot of experiences that kind of shade his destiny and it's a difficult role he did it beautifully without ever raising up flags or signs you said so. to me before we started that i asked you how was he and you said, said some of the same things but it, as you sat down but you said he also he carries the history of the film the imprint of the film in his head so that as he calibrates his emotional response he knows because it's shot out of order exactly yeah. where he was, even though something has intervened in between another scene at an earlier time. Exactly. I mean, it's a very delicate emotional map that he has to follow. And if we, you throw him scene 56 and then the next day scene 12 and then scene 22, it, that's really complicated emotionally for an How'd actor. How did you get Robert Mitchum? Well, you pick up the phone and call him and he said, of course... Well, it was, no, I, I went, I had to go meet him, but first it was through the producer of the film, Demetra McBride, and the casting director, Laura Rosenthal, got me in touch with him, and Demetra McBride was uh, very important in getting him into the film, you know, negotiating it, but I went to Santa Barbara and met with him for an afternoon and told him the story of the film, although he did most of the talking. Uh, it was an amazing, one of the more amazing afternoons in my life, just talking to Mr. Mitchum. What, what was it about that made it so amazing? Boy, I couldn't repeat a lot of the stories he told me. He told me a lot of stories about Hollywood, about his life, about drugs, yeah. about... You can't repeat it because you violate his confidence, is that it? Or? Well, yeah, he'd have to tell you. These were pretty wild things that yeah. he, he divulged. <laughs> Somebody, yeah, I wouldn't want to repeat. Before I see this clip, tell me the storyline that we should know about as Oh, man, the I'm character. the worst guy to do that because it's such a not kind of plot-oriented film. But it's a guy who goes out west to start in a kind of conventional way to find his new life, a young this guy. This is Johnny Depp. Yeah, and he's an accountant from Cleveland. This is in the 1870s. And uh, although the film doesn't tell you that, so it's not so important. As a murder. Yeah, he's going to have a job in a factory which he finds is not available when he gets there. Yeah. He meets a girl, 
Uh, they end up in her room, in bed together. His, uh, her former fiancé, played by Gab Gabriel Byrne, comes in, attempts to shoot him, but shoots the girl. Uh, the bullet goes through her and lodges in him, in Johnny's character, Bill Blake. And uh, then he jumps out a window, and from there on, the film is not conventional in any way. And that's <laughs> sort of where the story really begins, is this whole weird ceremony toward the sea where he's guided by this native character whose name is Nobody. All right, roll tape, here it is, Dead Man. Uh, black and white because it sets the... Well, it helps to, uh, it helps to go to another century, kind of. It, it gives you less, it takes a level of information away from the film that color gives you. And basically for this story, it's about a guy who He's traveling into, into a world that becomes less and less and less familiar, and I didn't want these landscapes to be familiar to the audience. I didn't, you know, I didn't want them to think Bonanza or, or even you know, Clint Eastwood movies or Shane or any of that. I wanted to step beyond that and kind of remove that. So the kind of eerie, haunting quality of the landscapes is preserved, I think, or is the, helped. Is the film you end up with the film that was in your mind in the beginning? Never completely, no. And I, I don't use a storyboard. We didn't even use shot lists for this film. Um, Robbie Mueller, the director of photography, elevated above my imagination the kind of look of the film. But the story changes because a film is not a sim simple auteur. For me, it's not like uh, what, you know, what I imagine will go on screen. It, it's about collaborating. So I collaborate with the actors, I collaborate with the director of photography, um, you know, things like Neil Young's score, obviously. Yeah, why Neil Young? Well, I, I had Neil, I was hoping Neil, I had the dream of having Neil Young do the score even while writing the film, but I, I really didn't think that would ever happen. But there's something about his, uh, well, the score is almost completely electric guitar, solo electric guitar, and Neil has a very soulful, emotional way of speaking through that instrument. He's always been one of my favorite guitar players. There's something damaged about it, something very, I don't know, very emotional. And, and he did a beautiful job. It, it is a very, to me, a very emotional score. Uh, thank you for coming. Thanks Pleasure for having, having me. Good luck with Dead Man.